It's a great pleasure to be here today uh, to talk about, about our work in deep and elastic scattering done many years ago. Uh, my talk will concentrate how uh, the quark model was established by our work and by subsequent work uh, done, in, uh, done in many places. Uh, it's especially appropriate for me to give this talk here because of CERN's essential uh, role in experimentally est establishing the quark model. I, and I'll tell you a, a lot about that in this talk. The first thing I want to do is put back the scaling curve that uh, Henry showed. And we didn't, I, and I want to sort of personalize this talk. I'm going to give some history. I'll repeat some of the things that Henry told you. I'm going to try to give you my, our reactions to some of the things that were observed. Now, um, the question about scaling was something which always intrigued us because we really didn't understand the origin. Uh, Your cane predicted on the basis of current algebra. We didn't understand current algebra. Uh, it was one of these things which was so obscure to experimentalists that we sort of threw up our hands. And we, we of course, tried to measure this particular phenomena, and we found it was there. But it was not clear what dynamical picture produced it, because after all, these were just commutators and anti-commutators of currents, uh, the origin of, of, of which basically uh, came from some particular model. Now, when, these, uh, w when this scaling occurred, and also the large cross-sections at, uh, at large angles, of course, many of the old physics models came into play. There was an enormous number of calculations. Vector dominance, resonance models, Veneziano uh, nucleons, deltas, regipoles, diffraction models. And as a matter of fact, many of these could generally um, account for some of the phenomena we observed, but never totally satisfactory. And I want to go talk somewhat about this in this talk. Now, as Henry told you, uh, one of the first big challenges when the results came out was vector dominance. After all, it had been very successful in some of the applications of hadrons in, uh, being, uh, interacting with photons in the past. And the idea was to try to uh, apply it and see whether one could explain scaling in large cross-sections on that basis. Well, when one did that, it became quite clear that one had to pay a price. You see, uh, when you have this particular thing occur, uh, Okay, this is going to be working. Uh, when you have this, uh, you see... It's working? It's working. It's working. See, oh, here, yes, yes, it's working. Okay. Okay, when the uh, photon comes in, couples to the, uh, to the vector meson, and this was a road dominance model, the only way one can get scaling, that is for large Q squares, or greater than the, the, the mass of the row, and for large energy losses, greater than Q squared, was to say that the longitudinal component of the photon. After all, if it's a virtual photon, it can have both the longitudinal and a transverse part. And the longitudinal uh, component really grew with Q squared. So uh, that, how, that is how one was able to get scaling in this, approximate scaling in this model. But it, 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 one had to pay a price, and that R, this parameter that Henry discussed, would grow with Q squared. And R was something we measured quite early, and of course this is just the ratio of the longitudinal absorption cross-section to, to the transverse absorption cross-section. Um, when we put the results in, we, we, we got the results. This is what we, what we found. And this is the, road, uh, the vector dominance model with the row, row dominance uh, for R, and these are the data, the data points. And it was quite clear that this model really could not apply. However, uh, this model was extended. The idea was to have generalized vector dominance, and the idea there was to say, let's not only consider the row, Let's consider a whole series of uh, vector resonances, vector meson resonances, and even ones that we haven't measured yet. Let's put them in and see whether perhaps uh, even in, for states that we don't know about, one could, get, one could get scaling. Well, when one did this, this model became very much like the other resonance models, and I'll talk about them later and some of the considerations that uh, applied in eliminate, eliminating them as, uh, as contenders. Now, these were all, the models I talked about were the so-called non-constituent models. They were based upon the old physics, extended particles, no basic structure. And of course, there were constituent models that, pe that, that arose. I want to point out that Bjork Kane was the, one of the first, perhaps the first person who indicated that, or suggested, that deep inelastic scattering could find a point-like structure in the nucleon. 
Um, this, this particular uh, sum rule comes from a sum rule by Adler. He used some sort of isotopic spin rotation to get this. And what this says is that the sum of the electron proton scattering cross section integrated over energy uh, and the neutron cross section is greater or equal to that of roughly a point, a point uh, object, point like object. So he says this inequality is of some interest in as much as it predicts a large amount of inelastic scattering at high momentum transfer, Q squared. The magnitude is comparable to that resulting from scattering off point charges. We shall find these results so perspicuous that by an appeal to history, an interpretation in terms of elementary constituents of a nucleon is suggested. Now, this is a very tentative point of view that uh, Bjorkain gave. It was given in the Varenna Lectures in 1967. Uh, it was based upon, again, current algebra. We did not really appreciate the significance of this. It had no real physical picture to us. We did not believe that this was probably a, a something that applied. Uh, and the other thing about it was that this was really saying that inside the nucleon were point-like things which were strongly, were strongly interacting particles. And in that day, the idea of having a strongly interacting point-like particle was really something that was really quite, quite bizarre. And so when we planned our experiment, uh, even if we knew about this, we didn't pay much attention to it. We thought that when the experiment would be carried out, we would get something like this, that the inelastic cross-section would, would fall with, with, with Q squared like this because, after all, the nucleon was big and sort of soft and mushy, and the inelastic processes would basically reflect that also. However, we found this. And this created a lot of a speculation about the point-like structure inside the nucleon because, as you well know, when you have a cross-section which is independent of Q squared, that in the, in, indicates a point-like kind of behavior. Um, now, Henry told you something about, uh, about Feynman, Feynman coming to Slack at that time. It was just before the Vienna Conference in 1968. Uh, he saw the results. He had been working on the parton model, but he would, had been working on it in terms of proton-proton scattering. His idea was that, well, let's consider, a, try to figure it out in, in field theory, have parts of the proton interact with parts of the proton. Uh, in the terms of a point-like interaction. And this is a way to, to basically describe proton-proton interactions. Uh, he'd been working on that. He came to Slack, heard about these res results, and, and said to, he said to us that he'd been working on the wrong problem. What he really should have been working on is the electrons interacting with protons, because with the electron, you knew that you understood its interaction with the proton, and you also knew that the electron was point-like, as far as one knew. So this is the way to look at the parton structure of the proton. And as Henry said, very quickly, he came up with a model. And the model was, a, was something that was very, very instructive to experimentalists and helped us think about how to analyze the experiments for them. Feynman kept very meticulous notebooks. This is something I got from Mike, Michael Reardon, who wrote The Hunting of the Quark. He had spoken to Feynman. And Feynman, when he, when he left Slack, he um, wrote down everything that he, 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 he discovered. He, for example, he, he talked about meeting M. Friedman. I don't think it was me. I think he, he, he mixed me up with somebody else. And Paul Tsai, where he found out about these results. Here are the cross-sections. And he goes on and he, and, he, and he works out the parton model in his notebook. It was really, was really quite interesting to find this. Notice the date. This was 81768. But what was this parton model? It was a very simple model. The idea was that the electrons would scatter from bound constituent partons incoherently. The partons would recoil and interact internally, producing the, all the garden variety particles that we see in the laboratory case, pies, etc. But there was a new element that he, he introduced in this discussion. If the partons are point like, that F2 and F1 will scale. He, he got Bjorkane scaling in this model if the partons are point like. But in addition to that, he was able to identify the scaling variable x, which is 1 over omega, with the, with the uh, momentum of the struck parton. In other words, x is the fractional momentum that the parton has if the, pot if the proton is moving. His model was done in the so-called infinite momentum frame, so the proton is going this way, the electron is going this way. The parton carries x amount of the, of the proton's momentum. x is a fraction. So x, that fraction x, is the scaling variable. So when an electron scatters off that parton of fraction x, it scales to the, it, it scatters to the scaling variable value x, 
you'll get a particular x for, from that. And that is q squared over 2m nu. And in addition to that, the f2x is related to the momentum distribution of the partons and the protons. So there are two things that came in addition to the scaling. One was the identification of the scaling variable and the fact that one could get the momentum distribution of the partons in the nucleon by measuring F2. And of course, uh, what were the partons? He didn't really want to specify that. He had, he had an open mind in that question. And very quickly, many theoretical approaches came in. Bjorkian and Pascos came in 1969. They introduced valence quarks with a quark anti-quark C. Uh, Kudi and Weisskopf in 1971 had a uh, quark anti-quark C in gluons. And so there, there were a number of such models, um, I think Lanshoff and Polkinghorn. Uh, and also there were models which had bare nucleons and pions. This were Drell, Levy, and Yan in 1970, and Lee and Drell in 1972. The idea here was that maybe these partons were actually bare nucleons in the proton. The proton had a bare nucleon, which was moving around, had, had pions moving around, and these things perhaps were, were, could act as partons, and maybe the electron was scattering off these things. And this is one of the things that one had to check. The quark model in 64 was very simple. It was three types, up, down, and strange, and uh, you all know about this. The proton is two ups and a down, and the neutron is two downs and an up. But of course, the question came up, uh, were quarks real? And that was one of the things that really kept on bothering people in those days, if one tried to compare uh, a quarks, uh, partons with quarks. Because there have been many unsuccessful searches in uh, accelerator experiments, cosmic ray experiments, terrestrial environment, that's uh, seawater, air, meteorites. And also people felt very uncomfortable with the idea of fractional charges. Um, that was considered to be an unreasonable feature of, of this type of model. And I would say the most general point of view at the time, although there were people who didn't feel this way, that quarks most likely just mathematical representations, useful but not real. And that's what the situation was in terms of how these things were regarded. Now I want to talk about some later data sets which basically had a, a large impact in trying to understand what the constituents of the, of the nucleon were and what the partons were. I think, um, and, but you see, before one could even consider that, one had all these other models, and if many models could, could explain the data, then there's no reason to pick a, a, a point like parton model. I mean, that, but that is a, that's a, a point of view that was not necessary. So in a certain sense, one had two responsibilities at that time, that time of doing the experiment. One had to, in a certain sense, eliminate some of these old physics models, and one had to see whether the parton model with quarks was consistent with the, with the results, and that's what I'll talk about. So we had, we had uh, after about 1970, we took a lot of data with uh, comparing electron-proton and electron-deuteron scattering, deep and elastic. The idea was to get more statistics, uh, a greater range of angles. We extracted the neutron cross-sections and structure functions. We used the impulse approximation, they were just mainly basically subtracting the proton from the, from the deuteron. One, of course, had to ap apply smearing corrections in order to do this because, of, of course, the nucleon is moving around in the, in the deuteron and one had to correct for that if one wanted to get a reasonable comparison with, with models. This is just a summary of, this, of the large number of runs we had uh, the angles went from, this, this is the high Q-squared running where we compared hydrogen and deut deuterium from 6 degrees to 60 degrees. Over an enormous range of, uh, of Q-squared, we uh, extracted R, new W2, W1, w and W1. And we had, a, I've got a large number of, of spectra. Let me just show you uh, some samples of it just to give you an idea of what came out of these runs. For example, I don't, you probably can't read this, but this 15 degrees and 19 degrees, uh, this is for the proton, and this is for the same, the same data for the deuteron. And we just had many, many spectra like that, just an enormous number of spectra, which, and we had to take that many spectra for two reasons. One is to make a, a consistent rate of correction uh, to all the data, and the other was to try to get as much data as possible to try to understand what was going on. <coughs> 
Now, here is a comparison of scaling that we got for, for the, uh, this is for the proton, the, the neutron, and the deuteron. So basically the scaling behavior is roughly the same for all three. <coughs> Measured R for the uh, proton and, and the uh, deuteron. And again, we, have, we took, took extensive measurements and we could not really find much difference within, within the errors. So we have a, a lot of data in, tr in terms of measuring R as a function of X and as a function of Q squared for both the, the deuteron and the proton. So we have that. Perhaps the most significant uh, thing that we measured was the ratio. Um, let me get to that next. I wanted to say one other thing before we get there. I'd like to just to show you this thing here. This was the, um, this was the, uh, the proton structure function minus the neutron structure function. And in this particular one, this is really a, a sensitive only to the valence uh, quarks, if you have a quark model. And uh, because the, the C's will cancel out. And the thing which is amusing here is you really get a quasi-elastic peak here, roughly around one-third. But the most significant uh, measurement that we made in terms of the, the, uh, the deuteron-proton uh, comparisons was to measure the ratio of the neutron to the proton yields as a function of x. Uh, and these are the data taken over a number of experiments. And what was, what was uh, really very important is that this ratio was extremely important in um, getting rid of a number of the old physics models. I'll discuss this in a moment. And so let me just, uh, just summarize the results from the, from the later data sets. The, pro the proton, deuteron, and neutron all had the same degree of scaling. The R uh, parameters for the proton, deuteron, and neutron were all roughly equal. They could be summarized by being roughly about 0.18. And this thing here was really very unexpected in a certain sense because it was approximately 1 at x equals 0 and 0.3 at x equal 0.85, and this ruled out many models decisively. The, um, the result at, uh, at x equal 0.85 was, the experimental result was 0.3 plus or minus 0.03. Now, the fraction model would give 1, Resonance models gave about 0.7, Reggie gave about 0.6, Duali 0.47, and those were clearly ruled out. Uh, the parton model of the bare nucleon and pions gave was too small, it was 0.1. Now it turns out if you looked at that model, you could put channels into it to increase it. But if you try to uh, put more channels into it, inelastic channels, it turned out that it destroyed the, uh, the threshold behavior of new W2, so one could not do it. Uh, so that basically that model became uh, unsupportable. The quark model was the only one which, which survived. It's, it wasn't very specific. It just said it, it had to be greater than 0.25. Now, this is, this is certainly sufficient to get rid of a number of these models, but it certainly is not sufficient to say these are quarks. So that, that became a big question. Now, what, how does one find out whether the constituents were quarks? Well, the thing which became very important is the application of the so-called sum rules. In the parton model, in the parton model, if you take nu w2, which would be uh, over omega squared, this, this is done in the old-fashioned terminology, and integrate it over, over uh, omega, this is equal to f2 of x dx, and it gives you the mean squared charge in the nucleon times the fraction of the nucleon's momentum carried by all the partons. <coughs> and if partons are quarks, it had a very simple answer. Uh, it became equal to the up, the up charge squared plus the down charge squared over two times the entire fraction of the nucleon's momentum carried by the quarks. We didn't know what this value was. Put a question mark here. This one you can, you can calculate. This is 0.28. The experiment gave 0.14. And that was small by a factor of two, as you can see. What did this mean? 
Well, people thought about that. You get the small number because of the fractional charges. And so you could only make it consistent with the quark model if the quarks carried only one half of the momentum in the proton. And in order to make it, in order to make it consistent, you have to say, well, something else is carrying all the, the, the other momentum. They have to be uncharged particles, and the candidate was gluons. Now, the thing about this is that this was rather, uh, this was a, 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 a rather unsatisfactory point of view in a certain sense, because one, one sum rule is measuring two numbers, the fraction of the, of the nucleon's momentum carried by quarks and the mean square charge. And so therefore, all that one could say is it was consistent if one had this. It required other information to disentangle this question. And the other information came from the neutrino scattering experiments. Let me just put this here. If you have electron scattering from, the, let's say, a, a quark, it interacts with the uh, charge of the quark, either, for example, the down quark charge or the up charge. And you, if, you have a, if you have the charge current interaction, it inter interacts with the, uh, with the uh, uh, quark in terms of, this, of the weak uh, interaction constant. So you can say that electrons and neutrinos both interact quark with quarks, and therefore there should be some similarity down here in this region. The interaction strengths are different for, for both the, uh, uh, the, the, the electrons and the neutrinos, uh, because clearly the electrons interact with the, uh, with the charges, and the neutrinos interact with the weak coupling constants. And therefore, if you take the ratio of electron and neutrino scattering, this should give information about these charges because this will not cancel out in the ratio. So if you take a ratio of inelastic electron uh, scattering and inelastic neutrino scattering, this should give you some information about the mean squared charges within the nucleon. And this is a very significant uh, set of results came from CERN in the large heavy liquid bubble chamber, Gargamel, 1972 to 1974. First of all, it was found that the neutrino and anti-neutrino cross-sections rose linearly with energy. This was expected on the basis of bjork kane scaling. So already one was seeing an effect which was consistent with scaling in the neutrino results. Uh, the evaluation of various sum rules were consistent with the electron scattering results and were a strong confirmation of the quark model. Here are the results. Uh, th these, these, uh, these results were presented in 1974, but these are the Gargamel results at lower energy, which at first appeared in 1972. And these are the Gargamel results. These are some results from Fermilab, uh, HPW, and CIT results. And you see a nice linear dependence on energy for both the neutrino, uh, for the antineutrino, and the neutrinos. And so that, that, that was well established by 1974. Now, if you look at the ratio of the sum of the structure functions for neutrino scattering and uh, electron scattering, again, because of the fact that the target, the, the quark part, cancels out except for the coupling constants, that ratio is just given by a very simple expression, and it's equal to 3.6. This was ig ignoring any possible effects of the strange C. And it turns out we know now that the strange C had only a very, very small correction to this ratio. Now, this turned out to be 3.6. If you took the, in 1972 uh, uh, at the Fermilab uh, High Energy Conference, um, this result was given by Gargamel as 3.4 plus or minus 0 0.06, very consistent with the quark model. So the first great consistent res result of the two was, was, uh, was produced, and we see that the mean squared charges are consistent with the quark model. But there are other things that one could, 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 could do. Let me, show you, well, let me show you this first. In 1974, the mean square charge was given as a function of energy. This is, this is the Gargamel results. Uh, these are the results from, another, uh, from a Fermilab experiment. And you see that basically 
uh, it was consistent as a function of energy. So, basic, so we have consistency as a function of energy. It was not just an, ar an artifact at one particular energy. And then, uh, in addition to that, uh, there was a very beautiful uh, comparison done in 1974 uh, between the actual structure functions gotten from Gargamel and the structure functions from the, the, uh, the slack MIT results. This is, these crosses are the sl uh, slack MIT results multiplied by 18 fifths, that, that ratio I, I talked about. And here are the Gargamel results. Now, since that time, of course, there have been many more neutrino results coming, many of them coming from here, um, CDHS, CHARM, Fermilab experiments. We've gotten these errors to be much smaller, and there's a very, very good comparison in terms of this particular set of curves. So you, the point is one gets the same structure function with both neutrinos and, uh, and uh, electrons, and the ratio is given by the fractional charges of the quarks. There were other neutrino results which were really very, very interesting and significant. If you took the, uh, you see now if you take the, the F2 from the neutrino uh, experiments, uh, and you, you, you basically take out the, the weak coupling uh, constant, it's equal to the total fraction of nucleons, of the nucleon's momentum carried by the quarks. And now the experimental value that Gargamel uh, uh, produced in 1972 was 0.49, plus or minus 0.07, and this was consistent with the assumption one had to make if one had a consistency with the electron scattering result, that half the momentum carried uh, only half of the momentum of the nucleon is carried by the quarks. So there again is a great consistency with the electron scattering results. And in addition, there was another sum rule, and that was uh, if you, the so-called F3 sum rule, which, which one has in neutrino scattering. And if you, uh, if you sum this over the scaling variable X, you get the number of valence quarks. And the experimental value from Gargamel turned out to be 3.2 plus or minus 0.6. Again, consistent with quark model. So it became clear that the combination of electron scattering results and, um, and neutrino results by 1974 had really pinned down the partons to be, to be quarks. I mean, it was really very difficult to escape from it at that point. And I think that's when the community started changing its point of view in general. By that time, I think people were starting to think about the fact that there was a, perhaps a quark picture, and these quarks were, were point-like. And people started doing theoretical work and started planning experiments on that basis. But there was, uh, and there was another feature which came in, well, I'll, I'll discuss it in, in, a, in a minute, which made it more satisfying, namely the QCD. So, by 1974, Partons are quarks. The constituents have spin one half because R, P, and R, N are small, shown by all, both the electron scattering and the neutrino experiments. The constituents have fractional charges from the electron and neutrino sum rules. The model of the nucleon was just basically three valence quarks, a, a quark, anti-quark C, and gluons. And that's, that was the model of the nucleon. But in order to make it really satisfactory, from an intellectual point of view, I think QCD had to be there, which came in 1973, because one, if one believed in, in quarks in the nucleon, one had to st still come to grip the, with, the, with the result or the conclusion that one doesn't find quarks anywhere. You look, you search, you don't find quarks. So how in the world do you support quarks in the nucleon? Well, you have to have a theoretical model which makes you feel convinced that maybe it makes sense. And QCD was proposed in 1973. Quarks were confined. The other thing which QCD said, which was really quite consistent with what was observed, was that quarks, the interaction between quarks goes to zero as the, the separation goes to zero, or as the relative momentum goes to infinity. And the thing about that is that this made the application of the impulse approximation in the lepton scattering re, uh, uh, experiments more, more reasonable. In addition, quarks and gluons were set to carry color, which was the strong force charge. There were three colors, and all three particles were color singlets, and therefore you could not see a quark by itself anywhere. 
Now, there were many, many important experiments which came later and which uh, also strongly supported the, uh, the quark model. Uh, let me just mention a, 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 a couple of them, a few of them. There was obviously the November Revolution in 1974, very important. The fact that uh, Charmoni was discovered both by uh, Sam Ting at BNL and also was discovered at, uh, at, at uh, Spear, at Slack, at, at Spear Machine by Bert Richter and his, and his, and his group. And uh, the thing about that is that, was, uh, that this gave rise to the study of an atomic system of a charm, anti-charm quark. One saw atomic levels, and that was a very satisfying way of sort of coming, uh, feeling that somehow here is a system whose constituent behavior was well established by the atomic levels that one saw. Um, let me just... Um, Here, for example, is a charmonium with a gluon exchange. Here's positronium with a, with, a, with a photon exchange. You have atomic levels for, for positronium. Here's this, those for charmonium. And there's some great similarities between those, these two. Of course, the energy uh, scales differ by a factor of 10 to the 8th. But aside from that, one sees the same kind of atomic structure, which is really very, very satisfying in terms of a quark picture. In addition, uh, in 1975, the jet structure of uh, uh, positron electron annihilation was observed at SLAC. The idea there is you basically have E plus, E minus, annihilate into a quark anti quark pair, and these things send out cones of particles and sort of retain the, uh, and actually uh, these particles retain some memory of the, of, the, of, the quark, of the quark characteristics because, for example, you can get the spin of the quark by the angular distribution of these particles. Also, the drell yant process was studied somewhat later, and there, basically, you, have, you take a hadron A and hadron B, and you have a quark-anti-quark -quark annihilation. Uh, for example, a quark in one and an anti-quark in another. Uh, they annihilate, make a lepton pair, and you can study these things, and there were, some, there were features uh, which were found which were, ver which were quite consistent with a quark picture. So, where are we now? We have, we have five flavors that we know of. We haven't found the top quark. It has a mass greater than 90 GeV at this point. Uh, we probably, I think we think that there are probably not any more flavors because of the results on the number of neutrinos, but that's, a, that's an assumption saying that, uh, that the, all, there, there should be a really light neutrino for every ne next flavor. But if one makes that assumption, uh, most likely six flavors is what we have. And of course, there's a range of of, of energies from a few MeV to 90 GeV, and that's a very, that's a very surprising and perplexing uh, range of masses for these objects. <coughs> the other thing that we now know is how, what is the limit of the size of the quark? We now know in terms of results from the CDF, it, looking, at, looking at various, uh, various uh, spectra and looking at the comparisons with QCD, that the quark is probably smaller than two times 10 to the minus 17th centimeters. <coughs> so it's exceedingly small. And what are the open questions about quarks? Do quarks have a finite size? Possibly. We don't know. So it has to be a smaller than what we've measured. Are quarks composite systems? Uh, because of the great range of masses, people have speculated that maybe quarks are excited states of something more fundamental inside. We don't know. At any rate, there's a new generation of, of colliders which will discover new properties of quarks or establish new limits, LHC and SSC, and the, these, these uh, colliders will be able to probe the size of the quark to 2 times 10 to the minus 18 centimeters. So in principle, one is able to, will be able to in the future to look at these things a factor of 10 smaller. Maybe some size will start showing itself. Maybe it'll be possible to see some, uh, a, uh, some evidence of a new uh, level of structure. At any rate, I think uh, it, it is very possible that in the next uh, decade, the evidence for this will start coming in, and I can't wait to see it. Thank you very much.
Thank you. I think the idea is that the discussion is transferred to outside where some refreshments are served for you. Thank you very much to the speakers. And before leaving, I think we once more applaud them and give them a standing ovation. <laughs>